All right, are you guys ready for your quarterly meeting with the SECO staff counselor? Because that's kind of what I am. I, I counsel the staff, and sometimes when I'm saying this, I, I see some of them sitting around, and I'm reminded of how messed up they are, and it makes me, it makes me want to be even more careful to make sure I say things that are helpful, because, gosh, they need it so badly. <clears throat> I'm going to throw some stuff at you today. Some of it's probably going to feel kind of different because um, I, I like to bring psychology and spirituality together. Um, I've learned some really cool stuff about how this thing works, and um, it's helped me in my own personal journey, and it's helped me with other people. So uh, you might have a moment or two where you're like, dude, this is a little bit weird, but uh, I, think it'll, I think it'll be okay. And here's the most important thing. If you notice the title at the top of your notes, it says shift this one thing I do. When the dust settles at the end of the message today, all I'm gonna ask you to do is pick one thing, just one thing to work on. So don't be weirded out if we, seems like we're throwing a lot at you, all right? How many of you ever had a how did I get here moment? You ever pulled into your driveway and you're like, I can't even remember the drive? You ever had that happen? You know, you're just like, I, I did it on a motorcycle. I don't know why I still remember this, but I, was, I used to work at St. Francis Hospital, and I rode my motorcycle home, pulled in the driveway with my wonderful wife, and it was like I could not remember anything about the drive. It was like I was transported. Now, all I'm trying to say to you is it, it's, it's an insight into how the brain works. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. How many of you have ever had a how-did-I-get-here moment in a relationship? How many of you have moments in a relationship where you're having an argument and you realize about halfway in or after it's over, how did we get here? What's the next word? Again. How many of you feel like you have buttons that when they get pushed, you react in ways that are not really intended? Say yes if you do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about how the brain works, just a little bit. And, of course, we're going to tie it with Scripture. But, but I want you to think about that how did I get here moment because it's, it's a little bit of a lever to get to where we want to go today. How about in your finances? You ever had one of those in your finances? Like you look at your money and you're like, man, I thought we'd be further. How did we get here? And there's reasons. And maybe just in life in general. You know, you have a moment where you, you look at your life and you think, you know, I, this just wasn't where I thought I'd be at this point. This isn't where I thought my marriage would be at this point. So what I want to do is answer a really important question. This is in your notes. Why do we repeat? Why do we repeat unhealthy, unhelpful behavior that doesn't work? How many of you have ever done something that didn't get you the result you wanted and you did it again? How many of you did it again? How many did it again, you know? I mean, you, 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 in the middle of it, you're like, dude, this doesn't work. Why, 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 why do we do it? Why do we repeat cycles in our marriages, in our parenting, in our thought process, in our relationships? Why do we do that? Look at this scripture. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. How many of you can say, oh, me, or amen, or something? And I do things I absolutely despise. So recently, I'm at a, a meeting with Pastor Greg and uh, Pastor Darren Patrick, and the three of us are going to be talking to a, a group of leaders. And, you know, our desire is to encourage them and just come beside them and make them feel good about themselves and help them move forward, right? So it gets to my part where I'm going to share, and I share content that's probably pretty decent. But about, let's say I shared about five minutes. About two minutes in, I realized I was angry. And I, everything I was saying had an edge to it. Do you like anybody to try to help you out and they're angry at you? You know, they're like up in your face and... And I, even while it was happening, I was like, dude, what are you doing? I wish I could tell you nobody noticed. <laughs> Everybody noticed. <laughs> Pastor Greg rarely would bring up an issue like that. But when we got alone, he's like, dude. And, and here's what the coolness of Pastor Greg. He said, I'm just concerned about you 
That, that's not you, dude. What was that? Now, what was it? And this is kind of an example of what we're going to be working on today. My father was not very encouraging. He was not very uh, uh, affirming. He was not very good at communicating emotional, uplifting stuff. Um, and again, don't weird out by this. He, he had a, a clear preference to my older brother, mainly because my older brother was more like him. He liked to hunt and fish and work with his hands, and I just liked to read. And I shot one deer, and I was like, you know, I don't really like killing deer. And I just, whatever, I was just different. So the point is, I grew up with this sense of, that I didn't please my father. I didn't make him proud. And so what happened to me was I had a sense of insecurity and inferiority when I got around strong, competent, driven, successful leaders. Well, God's really helped me with that. I mean, really helped me with that. This little thing I was just talking about happened just this last fall. I don't know what happened, but somehow that button that had really, I'd been pretty well healed in, got pushed again, and out came this just ugly stuff. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is I want to help you try to locate yourself in this whole process. Here's just one more scripture to kind of push us where I want us to go. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. How many of you want God to change you? How many of you really want God to work deeply in you so that your responses, reactions to life are different? Say yes if you do. Yes. You know, I, I, whatever, being the counselor type that I am, I, I, I think a little differently. I believe there's two tragedies in life. Two really important tragedies. Number one is not receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's like, boom, you're in trouble. That's big. But here's the second one. Living the same way after you have. Now, I don't mean that condemningly, like shame on you. I mean that like, guys, girls, there's stuff we can learn that you can be set free in deeper places than you ever imagined. God can break every unhealthy cycle you have, but you may have a part to play in it. All right, if you look in your notes, I think uh, up at the top it says, why do we repeat behavior that doesn't work? Why at times and in certain situations? So in these scriptures we've looked at, what's the focus? It's on our thinking and our mind, our thinking and our mind. How we think and this thing we call a mind and your next statement, the bold one, is this. It's that brain God gave you. The brain is something I've kind of, it's become a little bit of a hobby of mine to study it. And there's a design to it. God knew you were going to be working with a really complicated environment. And he designed our brain in some really cool ways. All the studying that's been done, nobody really fully understands how it works yet. We figured a little bit of stuff out. But we have no idea how your brain does everything that it does. But it does some really cool stuff. Like what? I'm up here talking to you, hopefully making sense, and I can walk and move my arms. I'm up here talking, walking, and moving my arms. Do I have to think to walk and move my arms? Do I have to think to do that? Now, most people instinctively say, no. Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Are you moving my arms? Are you moving my legs? Is God moving my arms? Wouldn't that be nice if he would do that? <laughs> what am I trying to say to you? Here's the thing. You do have to think to walk. You do have to think to move your arms. Key word, but not consciously. Here's what I'm getting at. Your brain's designed... Look at your notes. Let me say a couple things first. The brain has a very limited amount of a very important resource, attention. And so what God did is he designed your brain to preserve its limited resource of attention. And the way the brain does that, if you look at, it says there, uh, how does your brain handle the complexities of life? What your brain does is it builds habits that become subconscious scripts for different situations and behavior. In other words, when I was a little 
fella learning to walk, my brain was learning the script for moving my legs in certain ways. It's phenomenal. I love to watch babies. I love to watch, and I'm just, their brain is learning so much. It's phenomenal. But what happens when you learn something new, you have to think about it. You have to, you have to concentrate. In other words, you have to use a lot of your what? Attention. You got to use a lot of your attention to learn something new. Please remember that, because that's the key to changing your behavior. You've got to pay more attention. So, you pay attention, you learn, you kind of, you know, a little baby, it takes him a while to figure out that's even his hand. Then it takes him a little while to figure out, I can actually move that hand where I want it to go. And then it takes a little while to figure out, I can do pretty cool stuff with this hand. It's just, it's a phenomenal thing. So as you learn, what your brain's designed to do is form these habits slash scripts, whatever you want to call them, and then it, they move down, and this is not physiologically correct, but they move down, and eventually when you've learned something, it becomes part of your subconscious storage of scripts. I can walk and talk to you right now. My brain is still controlling this, but I don't have to think to do it. Say yes if you're with me. You with me? Okay. Guess what? You have scripts for intimacy. You have scripts for what do I have to do to gain approval? You have scripts for whether you think other people like you. You have scripts for how you respond to male authority figures. Now, here's the interesting thing. Where are they stored? Subconsciously. What does that mean? I don't always know they're in operation, often until it's too late. My wife and I, I got to pick on her a little bit, um, early in our relationship, my wife grew up with a, a critical parent, and she had this sort of performance need. She needed to perform, you know, and get everything just right. And it came in handy, you know, quite honestly. <laughs> but... Um, we would, early in our marriage, you know, I, I, would, I would bring up an issue that just didn't seem like that big a deal, but it would be constructively critical. How about that phrase? And then I go, it'd be constructively critical. And so the issue would be like this big. My wife's response was like this big. Now, why? She had a subconscious script that nothing you ever do is good enough and you don't deserve love and approval unless you're perfect. So when I would constructively criticize anything, it was like I was touching the core of her essence and identity. Say so yes, if I'm making sense, this is important. So she would respond, and I mean, wow, early in our marriage, I was like, guys don't do this, but early in our marriage, I would laugh at her. I would be like, what in the world? Because it, so, it was so irrational. But eventually, we learned some of the stuff that we're talking about today, and we were able to get down underneath there and figure out some of how that was happening. All right, when does the most important and powerful learning happen? I love this simple little two pictures we're going to use right here. In childhood, the outside shapes the inside. How many of you got to pick the home you grew up in? I always worry somebody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> I mean, nobody, nobody gets to pick their parents, their, their socioeconomic location, their, their race, their gender. You don't get to pick that. Well, you realize in your childhood, like, you're learning so much that is going to determine the choices you make throughout life. Well, guess what? You didn't get to choose that. So in that sense, you're not responsible. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But in childhood, the outside shapes the inside. In adulthood, the inside shapes the outside. See, see in this whole message, I've got really good news, maybe some bad news. I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. But here's the deal. Whatever your life is like right now, you helped create it. You helped create the life you're currently living and everything about it. 
Now, you may have done it out of programming you had no choice over, but here's the deal. No one is ever 100% responsible. No one's ever 100% responsible. But everyone is 100% responsible for their part. That fuss you might get caught in with your spouse or friend or parent or child, you may not be 100% responsible for the cycle, but you're 100% responsible for your part of the cycle. And that's what I wanna talk to you a little bit about today. How can we, how can we do better with it? So what we're gonna look at is a, a parable that Jesus told. And I love this thing. But here's what I want you to do as we go into this. I want you to locate yourself. What we're going to do is we're going to see four soils and four endings for those soils. And I want you to locate yourself. And then I'm going to have a prescription, if you will, for each of the soils. So let's just kind of look at this and uh, see where it takes us. He began to teach again by the sea and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. All right, if you just get the picture now, you guys are the crowd, maybe right up here's the beach and up here's the water. Crowd gets so big, kind of crowds him in, gets in a boat, pulls out here. Now, who is he talking to? All of them. All of them. Now through this parable, who is he talking to? All of us. And here's the deal. All of us are at different places. All of us are at different places. And he told this parable to give us an opportunity to locate ourselves because wherever we are affects what we do about it. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road. They're kind of off over there. And the birds came and ate it up. Guess what? They're kind of off on the edge, just sort of like curious, but they walked away with virtually nothing. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. Rocky ground, not much soil. Immediately sprang up. In other words, they heard it and got excited. Hey, this is cool. I think this is going to help me. But it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. After the sun had risen, all I read into that is this. After life happened for a little bit, it got scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Again, another not so good ending. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. This one grew some, and somehow something that Jesus later said was cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust for other things crept up and choked it out. Other seeds fell into good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, 100 fold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right, here's what we're going to do. He's talking to them, and he's talking to us. What did he want them to see, and what does he want us to see? He wants us to see where we are and why we're stuck. Where we are and why we're stuck. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the four seeds, and I want you to sort of try to locate yourself. All right? Now, this is all the Chip Judd version. I don't know if any the other theologians would agree with me. But from counseling, I've just kind of figured out that most of us are going to fall into one of these categories. All right, by the roadside, here's the thing. This person doesn't really see the problem or their part in the problem. They just, maybe life has been hard and it just feels overwhelming and helpless and hopeless. And they're not really like, I don't even know if there are answers for what I have. I'm just so jacked up. They typically externalize the source of their problem. It's your fault I get so mad. You make me act this way. If you'd been hurt the way I have, you'd understand. That's just the way I am. Everybody has issues. Now, what am I saying? They're caught in cycles, but aren't even self-aware enough or healthy enough yet to believe there's answers. There's help. And if you're in that category, here's the deal. We're really glad you're here. We're really glad you're here because we want to help you become more aware. These people might be defensive, numb, not, not even sure where to start, 
or if there's any help available. They might self-medicate. They might justify and rationalize their behavior. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. The rocky soil, hardness, hardness of heart to me represents pain. And these are people that have experienced pain in their life, but they're kind of aware that they've got a cycle they're caught in. They're beginning to see it a little bit better. And they realize that their reactions don't fit what triggered them. So they're sort of starting to own their part in the cycle. And that's really, really important and helpful. Among the thorns, remember Jesus said, cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust for other things. How, does, how do riches deceive us? By telling us they can meet needs they can't meet. Well, if I just make this much money, I'll feel secure. If I just get this house, I'll feel the approval of my peers. If I could just be friends with this group, I'll feel validated. And we use outside things to meet needs that they can't meet. And then, of course, the good soil is someone who's kind of processing their stuff, and it actually shows they're making progress. Now, what happens when you get here? You're going back through it on something else. Because here's what's happened to me. I used to see these as states that we were stuck in. Now I see them as stages that we all move through. Whatever your issue is, there's a stage where you just, you just don't see your part. Like, dude, you get right, I'll be great. And you don't see that you're as messed up as the person you're trying to get fixed. Then you start to awaken to it. And you start making connections to your past pain. And, you know, my reactions aren't as rational as I thought they were. And then things maybe are going better. But, listen now, you start pursuing not things that are wrong, but the way you pursue them crowds out your growth and progress. And then, of course, the last one, you're doing well, and you're probably going to cycle back around. If you look in your notes, there's another statement. Growth happens when we identify the state we are in now and see it as a stage in our journey toward becoming the healthiest, strongest version of the person God wants us to be. All right, here's what we did now. I've asked you to locate yourself. What we're going to do now, this is the shift one thing you do, this one thing I do, I want you to, if you've kind of maybe located yourself, I think I'm kind of here, then I'm going to give you one suggestion for what you can do. If you're in soil number one, take responsibility for where you are and how you got there. I believe the number one way we sabotage our progress and stay where we are is not recognizing and owning our part in what got us here. Somehow you've played a part in where you are. All right, let me read you a couple things in your notes. You may not be responsible for the way you are, but you are responsible for changing the way you are. You didn't get to pick your childhood. Rarely are the people that hurt you going to come back to heal you. Somewhere you're going to have to Take responsibility for learning how to get what you need in a healthier way. And if you stay focused on the people that have hurt you, you're, you're wasting your resources. Freedom and empowerment come from taking responsibility. Bondage and victimization from giving it away. Victims have a way they talk. Why do they keep doing that to me? A victim always sees their problem outside of themselves. Now, here's the deal. People hurt us. There's people in this room that have been horribly hurt. But I want to help you. And the deal is this. Yes, you've been hurt. Yes, people shouldn't have done what they did. But you've got to figure out how it has affected you and how it has continued to affect the way you steer, stir, and direct your life. Own your responses to life's challenges. You can't change other people, but you can change yourself so their behavior no longer works on you. It's really fun when you learn to take responsibility. It's really fun to watch people try to control and manipulate you. Because here's the thing. If I don't need anything you have, 
you really can't control or manipulate me. So what happens is we get caught in these unhealthy cycles. So that's soil number one. Soil number two, rocky soil. Don't waste your pain. How do you not waste pain? Learn from it. Learn from it. Use your present cycles to uncover past pain that still impacts your thoughts, feelings, and behavior. When Colleen was stuck in her thing, when I was stuck in mine, that we've learned to allow our weird responses to help us locate the trigger and then figure out what is there from our past, usually, that has created that trigger. Look at, next thing in your notes, pulling our thoughts and feelings out of unconscious autopilot into present awareness allows us to learn from them rather than be led by them. What do you, how do you do that? Ask yourself some questions. For one thing, why do I do that? Gosh, why, why did I react that way in front of those leaders? Another one might be this. What was I feeling? You may not know this about anger. Anger is always a secondary emotion. What does that mean? It's never the first thing you feel. You feel something, and then anger's your chosen response. So what you can learn to do if you have anger issues is, what was I feeling before I got angry? And what I was feeling was insignificant, inferior, insecure. Here's the deal. I'm never going to break that cycle unless I take responsibility for what I'm feeling. Now, what I've learned to do is what I call switch fathers. Because in the long run, it all went back to my father. But I, what I learned to do was let my heavenly father express how he sees me and feels about me. And I found he's pretty fond of me. I found he's pretty fond of you. I found that he knows we're jacked up a little bit, but he kind of understands that. And he's more than happy to come into our life and help us. And so it helps me find my wife, same thing. We, we just kind of had to figure out where's this cycle coming from? One of the this sounds so simple. But one of the most powerful things you can learn to do is just name what you're feeling. If you give a name to a feeling, you can manage it better. It's like putting a handle on a suitcase. Sometimes your feelings are just, oh, name it. You know, I'm feeling rejected. I'm feeling disrespected. I'm feeling ignored. Just naming it helps. So you got to work on that kind of stuff. Number three, among the thorns. Don't choke on God's goodness. I believe this is a person who life's, they kind of are moving through the stages and life's kind of working. And what happens is we start chasing and building and we don't even realize that we're, we're choking on all the stuff life's offering us. If you look in your notes, don't allow the idols of the surrounding culture to drive your pace and your priorities. An idol is anyone or anything, anyone or anything that I use to meet a need that only God can meet. Well, if I just had those people's respect, I'd feel better about myself. That's an idol. Well, if I just succeeded enough that my father was proud of me, that's an idol. Well, if I just made enough money, that's an idol. Now, is it all those things completely wrong? No, but they are if that's what drives you. It amazes me how many people you get around and they're like, man, I'm so busy. I had a friend that started every, I'm not exaggerating, every conversation, every conversation on the phone, I'm so busy, every conversation. I finally told him, I said, dude, I don't wanna hear it. Because here's the deal. You're the pastor of your church. You set your schedule. Don't, don't act like you're a victim. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I just, I gotta work this hard to reach my goals. Well, change your goals. <laughs> you bonehead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanna make $250,000. I never see my kids, never see my wife. I'm stressed all the time. Drop it to 175. Well, that's un-American. That's exactly my point. Sounds a little bit like another kingdom. 
You got to think differently. We're enslaved to our culture in ways we don't even realize. We're numb to it. Rest and margin increase the brain's capacity to manage life's challenges. When you're rested and have some margin in life, your brain works better. When you're stressed and anxious, it makes your brain just not work very well. How about this one? Put this to the side. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and I'll give you, you'll, you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Oh, well, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just burning out for Jesus. I don't know what book you're reading, but it's not the Bible. It's just not. How many of you know we get proud of being busy? Man, I'm so busy. You busy? I'm busy. I'm busier than you are. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> oh, help us, Jesus, please. All right, last one. Good soil. All right, here's where you got to make your choice. This one thing I do. Cool scripture. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting. One thing I do. One, say one thing. How many things do I want you to do? One thing, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on. What does that mean? This ain't going to be coasting. Oh, I want to change the way I respond to life. You can't coast. I'll be honest with you guys. This will be some of the hardest stuff you've ever done. Do you realize you can feel better than you've ever felt in your life when you finally realize you're your biggest problem? I'm serious. I love you guys, but I love you too much to lie to you. The biggest problem is the person you see in the mirror every day because you have the biggest impact on how your day goes, your life goes, the choices you make, and how people treat you. But you got to figure out where am I stuck? So I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Last one. This one thing I do, let me fill in the blanks. We tend to overestimate what can happen in a short period and underestimate what can happen in a longer period. What do I mean? Oh, I'm going to work on this. Two weeks, you don't see results, so you quit. If you pick something small, one of the biggest things I did was I picked, I want to learn how to receive and rest in my heavenly Father's love. I want to learn how to receive and rest. Ah. In my heavenly Father's love. It affected everything about me. That one thing, that one thing affected everything about me. Pick one thing and focus on it until the people around you see your progress. Pick one thing. Think small, start small, and you'll get big results. Think just something small. You know, I'm gonna smile at my husband when he comes home today. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not turn on the TV when I come home today. I don't know, something. Something that breaks a cycle and helps you land it better. All right, let's close with this scripture. Keep a cool head, stay alert. You're gonna have to pay attention. Remember, when you're learning something new, it costs you a lot of attention. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on the faith. The suffering, the trouble, the cycles you're caught in won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans they are, will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. Locate yourself and choose this one thing I do. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for my friends here. I pray for my wonderful kids and their friends. And uh, God, I just ask you to give us insight, give us courage, give us the grace to accept ourselves the way we are, but not stay that way. It's a weird kind of paradox to believe you love us just the way we are but you love us too much to leave us the way we are. Help each person in this room, God. I don't know the level of pain they've endured. I don't know the cycles they're caught in. But I know you can, 
and will help them. And I thank you for it, sir. In Jesus' name, amen.